question, and that is probably the um, primary small talk question that adults get is, what do you do? And I know that there are many people in this room who do incredible things, both for their communities and for mankind as a whole, but I like to think that I've got sort of the conversation stopper of them all, and that is, I look for aliens. And um, <laughs> normally that's sort of where you stop and, and someone says, well, would you like me to pour you another drink or, or something like that? You notice it's another drink. And um, instead today, what I, I think I'll do is, um, to my 500 close friends here, reveal the secrets of how you actually do this. And so um, let me take you a little bit beyond Santa Cruz and beyond planet Earth to um, see what else we can find. And I realize if you ask the question, how do you hunt for an alien? It's not unlike hunting for anything else. And I'm not actually a hunter myself, but my boss happens to be a hunter, so I picked his brain the other day, and we realized it's pretty much like hunting any other game, though start by saying don't use a gun because you're gonna be pretty much out of your microbe by then. So if you're hunting for something, like you know, any sort of large charismatic mammal, um, the first thing you have to do is plan for your trip. There's a whole lot of preparation work, and that's most of what we do. You actually have to go to your location. Once you get there, you have to set up camp and do a little reconnaissance and decide where you're going to go and you know, sneak up on them. You have the actual hunt, and then you get to go home with your game if you're lucky. So let's try this in the um, astrobiology realm, hunting basics. So before the trip, as I said, there's a whole lot of prep work, and that's mostly where we are at this point. Um, and so we'll start to look at some of these questions. And this may sound really trivial if you were a big game hunter, but the first question really is, what are you going to hunt? And that is not at all trivial if you're looking for a real alien. The first thing you have to ask is, what is life? I mean, how do you even know if you find it? So I'm going to start with da Vinci, who gave a great definition for life several centuries ago. Um, he gave a definition, actually not for life, in fairness it was for water, but it gives a really nice analogy. He said water is sometimes sharp, um, sometimes strong, sometimes acid, sometimes bitter, sometimes sweet, sometimes thick, sometimes thin, and so on and so forth. You get the idea. It's a description of water. The way we define water today is very simple. Water is H2O. Well, I would like to make the point that we are sort of the same way with life right now. We're sort of at that da Vinci stage where we can describe life, but it's very difficult to define it. And furthermore, we may never actually have a definition for life. But we need some sort of operational definition if we're going to go out and look for life in the universe. Now, NASA has this kind of grand definition, life is a self-sustained chemical system capable of undergoing Darwinian evolution. Now, that's not a bad one, but honestly, I don't know most of you, and if you were made this morning in some chop shop down at the campus, I would still give you credit for being alive. So we could pick holes at this. I, I am not privileged to any extra information, by the way. I'm just, just saying that as a rhetorical point. There's the other possibility, and that is, you know, we'll know it when we see it. And so we sort of have to hope a little bit on those. But I can at least give you a little information about what it's likely to be made of in a moment. But the next thing you have to do once you decide what you want to hunt, and this is all important, is you have to raise some funds for this. Now, in the astrobiology business, you may need to raise funds in all different currencies, and it's going to be a whole lot more than you're going to need to drive a van out to Wyoming. You're going to need to raise lots and lots of money, and fortunately, we have a couple of major space agencies interested. We do have some private individuals and so on. There's a last pound coming in at the top. Um, you also need a hunter's license. Now, we don't actually go to some bureau and say, you know, I would like a license to hunt Martians. But you do have to be very careful about where you go. And for that, at NASA, we have a planetary protection officer. The moment, it's uh, my colleague Cassie Conley. And her motto is, all the planets, all the time. And in fact, we're not worried just about aliens approaching us, sort of an Andromeda strain thing where we all drop dead of some Martian virus. But in fact, we're also concerned about contaminating other planets, because it would be an enormous tragedy is if we went to Mars and we contaminated it and we lost our one chance to actually find a second example of life. So we have to worry about that. So she's told me, for example, if we go to Mars, we have to be very careful where we might go um, and how we, we actually do this landing 
fishing and hunting and so on. On the other hand, there are lots and lots of asteroids out there, and I think the basic line was, send me a postcard and let me know which one you contaminated. So we'll go from there on that. So you need to know where to hunt. And um, this is tied in with where, what you're expecting to find there. And um, I said here, find me some carbon. I think you can make a very, very strong argument that anywhere you're going to find life, not just in our own um, solar system, but in our galaxy and in the universe as a whole, it's going to be based on carbon. And not just any carbon, but what's called organic carbon. So it doesn't count if you have a pencil, and it doesn't count if you have a diamond ring. But virtually every other form of carbon would count. Carbon does all sorts of very, very cool chemistry. So there you go. I found you some carbon. And, and I know there are people in the room thinking silicon, and yes, silicon can do some interesting things, and there are days that I feel like my computer's alive. But in fact, <laughs> the first form of life is likely to be based on carbon. And honestly, if you were going to find a place that was based on silicon, we're sitting on it right now. We are sitting on a very large silicate rock. Most of planet Earth is either silicon or oxygen, very, very tiny slice of carbon. The next thing we need is some kind of solvent, and for that, um, we use water in our own bodies. All planet Earth uses water, and it's a possibility of some other things, but water is a really great idea. Um, it's got all sorts of properties. It floats when it's, when it's solid. It has all sorts of chemical bonding properties. It's a great solvent. There's lots of it out there, and so it's not a bad strategy to follow the water. Um, in fact, here's a picture of a solar system starting to form. It's sort of like a photograph of our own solar system 4.6 billion years ago, although I understand that Kodak even was in its infancy 4.6 billion years ago. So that's actually someone else's um, solar system. But it gives you an idea, and you can see this light blue ring of water vapor that eventually become a cometary disk, just like we have here. So lots of it out there. And also we need time. People say we need lots and lots of time for life to evolve. Why do they think that? Because life is complex. No more than that, there's no sort of grand equation. We don't know. So it may be that um, once we find the secret for creating life, it'll turn out to be a long three-day holiday weekend. What did you do? I went to the beach. What did you do? Well, I made life during the weekend. We don't know. But we have this idea, it takes a lot of time, and we have this idea because it took, we think, at least a billion years, half a billion to a billion years for life to arise on the Earth, because that's when we start to see it. We may have it much earlier, and we just haven't found it yet. That's a long time. But again, we only had one narrative. And can you imagine if you had only read one book in your entire life, and you then made grand generalizations about all of literature? That would be incredibly naive, and that would be the same thing here, because we only have this one narrative, and that's life on planet Earth. So even with the water and carbon bit, there are a whole lot of places that we can go, even on our own solar system. Venus at one point had a good water inventory, just like planet Earth. Um, what happened is there was a runaway greenhouse, a lesson to us on planet Earth, and water is a great greenhouse gas. It's possible that life arose on Venus and went into the clouds. The next planet Earth we know is infested with life. If you don't believe me, look around the room. The next planet, Mars, is sort of the opposite of Venus in that it's small, and it lost a lot of its atmosphere, but we have a lot of evidence that there was liquid water on the surface. Great place for a potential life form, um, certainly in the past, possibly even today. Then once you move out, Ceres, oddly enough, has just hit our radar screen. It's the largest object in the asteroid belt, and it looks like it's ice covered with potentially liquid water beneath the surface. So if we want to go ahead and rearrange the solar system, as has been suggested recently, that's the guy I want to bag and bring in. Europa is a similar sort of situation. This is another moon. This is a moon of Jupiter, and it's also ice covered, and it also, we think, has a liquid water ocean beneath this shell. You go out to Saturn, Titan is a moon of Saturn that's covered not with liquid water this time, but with organic carbon, this kind of carbon that makes life. And we know there's water there because it forms rocks. So if you can heat it up enough, you've got the liquid water and the organic carbon. So big questions on Titan. Pluto, even people have suggested Pluto, that thing that used to be called a planet, 
might have ice with liquid underneath there, trans-Neptunian objects and so on. We could spend hours on just this alone. So what I'm going to do is just give you one example, we'll go into a little more detail, and that's Enceladus. This is a little tiny moon of Saturn and it's just come on our radar screen the last few years. It also, as I say, tiny, here's a picture of it hovering over the United Kingdom. And um, it's not that, that we have people in Scotland looking out for Enceladus. This is simply meant as, as a matter of scale. So it's a tiny moon, you notice right away it's bright white and there's some discoloration and this is organic carbon. Um, and even better, Enceladus has this little water spout that's coming out, um, and so you can see from this thermal map that there's water, and we already have some preliminary evidence of what's in the water, and it's all sorts of compounds that would just warm your heart if you were an organic chemist or a prebiotic chemist. <laughs> um, but these are the sort of building blocks that would go towards making life. So there you've got the liquid water and the building blocks. Furthermore, we have an example of life on planet Earth, and we have many organisms on planet Earth that are able to push the extremes for temperature and all sorts of things. So these organisms give us an idea of the minimum envelope for life. So I like to think of them as the Olympians of the biological world. So these are ones that are able to push to the physical and the chemical extremes. Here's a, a photo of one of our field sites from Kenya, and you can see here high temperature with that geyser there, organisms that can live all the way up to 121 degrees centigrade, so way above the boiling temperature of water. pH range from 0 to 12 or so for life at this point. Desiccation, so organisms that can dry up for long periods of time. High salinity, you see these organisms in the salt ponds over the South San Francisco Bay when you fly in, Cargill. Um, chemical extremes, pressure extremes, extremes in radiation, extremes in oxygen. And I wish I could tell you about all these organisms, but I, I don't have the time to. But, but what if there are places out there that would be really cool to look for life, and we don't have an example on planet Earth of an organism that could actually live there? Well, one of the projects that we've done in my lab is look to see whether you could turn to synthetic biology and tweak these organisms that we find on planet Earth to buy you something. So for example, if 121 degrees is the highest temperature an organism can live on Earth, could we make one that lives at 125 or 130, which would then give us an idea that it's at least possible for life to live in those conditions. So over the, since some... Um, 2011, I've had an a iGEM team, International Genetically Engineered Machine Competition, of these incredibly enthusiastic students from Brown and Stanford University in my lab, and I'll give you an example. This is our 2012 team, wonderful students, full of beans, lots of energy, um, very bright and, and energetic. And one of the projects they did in 2012, and this is over about four months, so this is three or four students over four months, um, is try to specifically do this, to make artificial extremophiles. What I love is with these students, there's always something, you know, twist to it, so they call this the Hell Cell Project. And we were able to make organisms that were able to push all these extremes. So this is a very promising approach. Now, there's a whole lot of else, else you have to do before you actually bag an organism, and I, I know I'm going to be running late on time. You do need to check your vehicle before the trip, and so on and so forth. Fortunately, we can hand that over to the engineers, and then it's time to go, and you take your little spacecraft, and off you go. Once you arrive at a location, if you're lucky enough to go, you need to set up your camp, do reconnaissance, spot the game, and so on. Um, where much of that needs to be done in advance on planet Earth. We do have things up there that will be taking commands from us. We've had rovers and so on. And now it's time, of course, to actually um, do the hunting. And we've had a few um, experiments up there, mostly um, in the, the 70s, the Viking missions, to actually look for life. Most of what NASA's been doing ever since then has been sort of laying the groundwork, looking at the environment and so on. So it's not as much of a directed hunt for various reasons, but we're getting a much better picture of what might be there. Um, and as you can see, there, there are a few astronauts on the moon. They weren't actually hunting for life, but this is what we would love to have some days, actually have a human presence up there looking. Um, of course, if you were a real hunter, you would then harvest it, tag it, 
put on the date, location, and so on, um, field dress it. It's a little difficult to field dress a micro, but I suppose you would you know, put it in a tube or whatever. You bring it back to camp, you take a look at it, and this we're going to count on our, our rovers to do, and so on. Um, but someday it would be great to actually bag an alien and then bring it back. So we've gone through all these steps, and that's all well and good, but as real hunters know, habitat changes, the game changes, the weather changes, and so on. So you've got to be prepared for all these things. And even worse for us, what if you can't get there at all? We know that there are a lot of extrasolar planets in our galaxy and no doubt beyond where there might be life, but we're never going to get there. We may be able to send a robotic precursor someday, but this is so far in the distance. But our curiosity is going to get the better of us, so we need to use methods like spectroscopy and get an idea of what the atmosphere might be like to give us an idea whether there might be life. Of course, if you're looking for intelligent life, maybe you'll get a signal. This is not actually an email I got. Um, the address you want to write down is tedx at alpha centauri .com. Um, There was no actual content attached to that email, but that would be fabulous to have in the inbox. <laughs> what if after all this hunting, someday we, we come to the realization we really are alone in our solar system, in our galaxy, in our universe? I think this will be a very profound philosophical shift and, and possibly an ethical shift for our descendants. But the thing is, we may find life within our lifetime, but we will never do the negative. We will never be sure within our lifetime that there is no life out there. Now, I did want to end sort of getting back to some of the other talks today, and, and perhaps some of you are wondering, why are we even doing this? Because there's certainly a lot of problems on planet Earth. And one of the things that I've done um, when we've gone to field sites in Kenya, for example, is to go into schools. And so this is a village that we went into outside of Nairobi. And I don't need to tell you, you can just take a look at the picture to get an idea um, what sort of conditions these kids are under. Two-thirds of the ones in the school where I went into were orphans. Let me show you these kids here. Um, most of them had never touched a book. The I can't even tell you what the classrooms were like, but these kids were sitting there listening to me on a day that was a holiday, packed in from about eight years old to 16. Why? There was one reason, and that is because as humans, we are much more than well-fed sheep. What makes us human is this intellectual curiosity, and the kids were there because of their desire to be part of the greatest achievements of mankind. With that, thank you very much for your time.